Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sentencing Project's online book discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Morgan McLeod, and I'm the Communications Manager here at the Sentencing Project. Today's book discussion will highlight Angela D J. Davis's new book, Policing the Black Man, Arrest, Prosecution, and Imprisonment. Policing the Black Man is a comprehensive analysis of the key issues of the Black Lives Matter movement and features 12 essays by some of the nation's most influential and respected criminal justice experts and legal scholars. The book explores and critiques the many ways the criminal justice system impacts the lives of African American boys and men at every stage of the criminal process, from arrest through sentencing. In a few moments, we will hear first from Angela Davis, editor of Policing the Black Man and professor of law at American University's Washington College of Law. And she will be joined by contributing authors, Kristen Henning, professor of law and director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic at Georgetown Law School, and Mark Maurer, executive director at The Sentencing Project. There will be a Q&A after we hear from Angela, Mark, and Kristen, and you can actually submit your questions throughout the discussion using the panel on your webinar screen to the right. If you look on the bar, um, there's a section called questions, and you can submit them through the discussion, and we encourage you to do that. So to begin, I will hand things off to editor of Policing the Black Man, Angela Davis. Angela, Kristen, and Mark, you can all share your web screens now. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, and thanks to the Sentencing Project for inviting me to host this discussion of Policing the Black Man, and particularly happy to be joined by two of the contributing authors, Chris Henning and Mark Maurer. Um, when I was approached uh, a couple of years ago about the possibility of editing a volume, an anthology, that would attempt to discuss and contextualize the many awful killings of black men in recent years, I seized the opportunity because there's no issue more important to me uh, than the unfair treatment of black and brown people in the criminal justice system today. Um, and so I thought about who I would ask to join me in this project, and I reached out to the, some of the nation's leading authors, teachers, scholars who've been writing and advocating around and thinking about and in many instances living this issue. And I was quite fortunate that so many of them, including the two that are with me today, said yes to the project. So I thought before opening the discussion I would talk a little bit about the book in general. Um, why this book and why now? There have been so many killings uh, of black men uh, in recent years by police officers. Uh, and of course, these killings did not start in recent years. Black men have been killed by police officers uh, and by vigilantes who took the law in their own hands since the time of slavery, since black people were brought to this country in 1619. And these killings have continued throughout history uh, consistently up to the present day, and they continue today with remarkable brutality and frequency. Um, but the difference is that now, um, because of technology and social media, uh, cell phone cameras and social media, we're all now literally witnessing these killings uh, repeatedly. Uh, we saw Eric Garner being choked to death. We saw 12-year-old Tamir Rice uh, being gunned down by police officers as he played with a toy gun in a park. Uh, we saw Walter Scott get shot in the back as he ran away from police officers. We saw Terrence Crutcher with his hands in the air being gunned down on a Tulsa, uh, a Tulsa highway. We saw these with our own eyes. Um, and most of these police officers were not even charged with these killings, and the few that were charged, none of them to date has been held accountable for these killings. Now, the authors um, who write about these killings specifically in the book uh, discuss the killings. They explain what happened, the many factors that contributed to the outcomes, the unfortunate outcomes in these killings, and in many of the chapters they actually suggest ideas for reform. But the killings of these black men, they served as the catalyst or inspiration, if you will, for the book. But the book goes further to talk about all of the ways that black men are policed 
in the broad sense of the world, word, heavily and harshly at every step of the process from arrest through sentencing. Black men are stopped and searched and arrested far more frequently than white men that are engaged in the same behavior. Black men are charged more frequently and with more serious crimes than white men who are engaged in the same behavior. And there are a disproportionate number of black men in the nation's prisons and jails. Now, I've often been asked, you know, why does the book focus only on black men? Aren't there other people who are treated harshly in the criminal justice system? And the answer to that question is yes, uh, definitely. Um, there are black women, uh, Latinas, Latinos, uh, other people of Native Americans and other people of color uh, experience violence uh, at the hands of the state and are discriminated against in the criminal justice system at every step of the process, no question about that. Um, as are people who are gay, lesbian, and or transgender. So the focus in the book on black men in no way trivializes the experiences of all of these groups. <laughs> But in many ways, the experience of black men is unique. Uh, the most notable differences, the most noticeable difference is that they are impacted more adversely than any other demographic in the United States at every stage of the process. Um, black men are treated worse at every step. Um, black boys are disproportionately arrested and detained, as Chris Henning will discuss in a few minutes. They're more likely to be referred to the juvenile justice system. Black men are disproportionately arrested. Uh, in fact, African Americans are 2.5 times more likely to be arrested than whites. And 49%, almost half of black men, can expect to be arrested at least once before the age of 23. Black men are more likely to be killed or injured during a police encounter. In fact, African Americans, African American men in particular, are 21 times more likely to be killed by police than white men. Black men are disproportionately imprisoned and receive longer sentences. Um, and blacks are also disproportionately sentenced to death. So for all of those reasons, the book focuses on black men. And before I, I turn to Mark to open our discussion, I just want to uh, mention the other authors uh, that have contributed chapters to the book. They include uh, Brian Stevenson, the director of the Equal Justice Initiative, um, in addition to Mark Maurer and Chris Henning, Renee Hutchins, Professor Renee Hutchins of the University of Maryland Law School, Professor Catherine Russell Brown, the University of Florida Law School, um, Tracy Mears and Tom Tyler, both professors at Yale Law School. I also contributed a chapter to the book. Uh, professor Roger Fairfax of George Washington Law School contributed a chapter, as did Professor Ronald White of the uh, Wake Forest Law School. Um, Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Cheryl, Sherilyn A. Eiffel, and Jen He Lee, who is a staff attorney at the Legal Defense Fund, contributed an essay, uh, as did Jeremy Travis and Bruce Western. So let me start, Mark, with you. Um, you point out in your chapter of the book, which is entitled um, The Endurance of Racial Disparity in the Criminal Justice System, you point out that in 1954, on the day that Brown versus Board of Education was decided, that there were about 100,000 black men in our nation's prisons and jails. But today there are 600,000. So I wonder if you can talk to us about how we can understand this increase, especially coming as it did during a period of civil rights progress uh, in our nation. Well, thank you, Angela. And first, uh, let me just express my thanks to you and the publisher for including me. It's a real honor to be in this collection of, of essays in the book. So we do have a real challenge to explain that we've had over the last half century the opening up of social and economic opportunity for many people for whom that had previously been denied. And we can see this in many areas of society. And yet, when we look at the criminal justice system, the situation for black men and other people of color is much, much worse, much more punitive than it was at the time of the civil rights movement beginning to take hold in this country. So how do we understand that? 
Well, it's a complex issue, I think, but there are also other developments, changes in American society taking place, too, at the time that mass incarceration began in the early 1970s. Uh, we saw the social and economic changes uh, taking place, globalization beginning, the beginnings of inequality or massive inequality in American society has been well documented over the last four decades that coincides and overlaps with the development of mass incarceration too. And we saw that these changes disproportionately affected low-income communities of color, the loss of manufacturing jobs, higher unemployment rates, uh, impact on declining wages over time, uh, family stress and strains taking place. We also saw by the 1960s and 70s the impact of the baby boom generation coming of age. You know, we know that all things being equal, young males in age group 15 to 24 commit a disproportionate share of crime uh, in those years, and we saw that taking place as well. <clears throat> so there was a problem of crime, or rising crime, in the U.S. in the early 1970s. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the arrest data are not as sharp as they are today, but if we just look at murder rates, for example, the murder rate in the U.S. doubled between 1960 and 1974. So we had a problem of crime. The question was, <clears throat> how should we deal with that problem? Now, normally, there are many ways we could deal with a public safety issue. We could talk about expanding opportunity. We can talk about better schooling. We can talk about enhancing drug and mental health treatment programs, many other kinds of interventions, as well as criminal justice initiatives. But to the extent that the crime problem was viewed as a so-called black problem, then punishment became the means of choice for dealing with this problem that and we now call mass incarceration. Mass incarceration involved sending more people to prison, keeping them there for long periods of time. Now, why was this defined as a black problem and everything that came about from that. Well, we have good research that shows us when we ask respondents to identify the proportion of certain crimes that are committed by African Americans, that white respondents typically overestimate the proportion of crime committed by African Americans, typically as much as 20 to 30 percent higher than the actual rates. And from there, we also know that to the extent that crime, a particular crime, may be identified as a so-called black crime, then white support for punishment increases. So we over-identify crimes with African Americans, and then those crimes become punished more harshly. Uh, and these are data that we know from. Studies in white respondents, most legislators in this country are still white themselves, and there's no reason to believe that their thinking about these issues is different than the population at large. So we have this approach, uh, which then leads us to mass incarceration, the policies that go along with that, uh, the sentencing policies, the prison release policies, and the like. Many of the policies adopted here have been race neutral on the surface, but in practice have a very predictable racial uh, effect. Uh, we've seen much documentation about the war on drugs, certainly the crack cocaine penalties passed by Congress in many states in the 1980s. Uh, now we see the opioid crisis today, which has been another terrible crisis we're facing. While there are a range of approaches being taken in the opioid crisis, I think it's clear that approaches involving prevention and treatment are far more widespread than they were during the crack epidemic of the late 80s, early 90s. And it may not be any surprise that the face of the opioid user and abuser 
is much more likely to be a white face, certainly compared to the crack cocaine years and the identification there. Uh, we also see this in other policies of the war on drugs. Uh, every state has some type of school zone drug law that penalizes crimes committed in near a school zone much more harshly. Uh, what we find is that in urban areas that are densely populated, virtually any drug offense can be considered near a school zone in contrast to suburban and rural areas where it's much less likely. And given that people of color and black people are more likely to live in urban areas than whites typically are, then those penalties get applied to people of color much more so. Uh, several years ago, analysis in New Jersey found that 96% of the school zone drug penalties were applied to African Americans or Latinos, which uh, led the legislature to scale back the severity of those policies. Uh, we also see race-neutral laws having an effect in habitual offender laws like three strikes and you're out. Any policy that penalizes people more harshly based on a prior record. And the reason this plays out is that African Americans are more likely to have a prior record than other groups. This may be because of racist policing practices, it may be greater involvement in certain crimes. Whatever the cause is, an African American defendant is more likely to have a record and therefore more likely to be subject to these harsher penalties. Uh, this has been the case for many, many decades using prior records to enhance penalties, but in the era of three strikes and you're out, when a third strike can lead to a sense of 25 years to life, then the scale of that increase becomes really quite substantial and quite dramatic in how this impact plays out. So we have a whole set of policies that have contributed to what we see over the last half century. And the challenge today, I think, is that mass incarceration, in many respects, appears to become institutionalized. Uh, yes, the reform movements today, and yes, a number of states are reducing their prison populations, uh, but we have to keep in sight, I think, the scale of the problem, mass incarceration developed over a period of four decades. We're not going to end it overnight. Uh, we need to start to think very broadly about how we address these problems. Thank you, Mark. A lot of issues there that I'm sure are, um, we'll get a lot of questions about and hopefully get a chance to discuss further. But I now want to turn to you, Chris, um, to talk about your essay, which is called Boys to Men, the Role of Policing and the Socialization of Black Boys. And in your chapter, you help us to understand the interactions between black boys and the police and how black boys are socialized to interact with the police. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, definitely. Thank you, Angela, for inviting me to join this conversation both today and in writing. And thank you, Mark, and the Sentencing Project for um, pulling us together today for this conversation. So, um, yes, Angela, I, I definitely take the position in this chapter that black boys are policed. Um, like no one else in society. Um, if we think about how much interaction young people have with uh, police officers, they actually have, um, they're much more likely to have regular contact with the police than with adults, um, in part um, because they play in the street, they con congregate in public spaces, they ride around um, in cars talking loudly. Um, but beyond the uh, what I call hyper surveillance of um, youth by the police, the reality is that we live in a society that is uniquely afraid of black boys. So let's go back to Tamir Rice. You talked about Tamir Rice, 12 years old, um, shot near a recreation facility, Cleveland in 2014. If everyone will remember um, how the police uh, attempted to reconcile this or to defend this, um, and they kept talking about Tamir's size. They talked about how um, he was, um, I believe, 170 pounds, you know, five feet seven, um, size 36 pants. 
Um, he wore a man's extra large jacket and clearly all of that um, prevented them from seeing his very 12-year-old uh, baby face that is just so evident in the pictures. Um, but the reality is also that Tamir is not alone. Um, the empirical research on implicit racial bias shows that um, both uh, the society in general and police officers in particular tend to overestimate the age of black boys by 4.5 years. Um, and this is tremendously significant. And what does all of uh, this mean, this distorted perception mean for, um, for black boys? I mean, obviously it means that they're more likely to be seen and to be treated like adults in any context, including the criminal justice system. Um, it also means that they're uh, less likely uh, than white boys uh, to have the benefits or the mitigating benefits of being a child. Um, they don't get the benefit of the doubt. Um, they don't uh, get the benefit of our society's typical tolerance for normal adolescent indiscretions. Um, they're more likely to be stopped and harassed for their normal um, adolescent behavior, um, and they're more likely to be harassed, assaulted, and even shot for appearing to be threatening when, in fact, they are not. Um, and so with regard to this question of socialization, um, the reality is also that black boys know this. They know, um, they understand police officers' perceptions of them. Um, they learn about this through the media, as you talked about, um, Angela, at the start, through the media, the internet, through vicarious experiences um, of their family members, uh, through personal interactions of their own with police officers in schools, on the street, um, and even at their homes. And so my argument is that early encounters um, with the police have a profound impact on the way young uh, people, and black boys in particular, come to view the law and come to view law enforcement officers and how they interact with law enforce, uh, enforcement officers as they transition into adulthood. Um, and these perceived, real or perceived, but the perceived injustices um, by the police um, uh, have, uh, they undermine police legitimacy and undermine the respect that black boys would otherwise have or might otherwise have for police officers. Um, uh, the, the early interactions or encounters with police officers um, really leads young black boys to be socialized to behave in one of three ways um, uh, in their encounters with police. Either they respond with fear, they respond with flight, or they respond with fight, or, and by that I mean by uh, resistance. Um, and so over time, this, this sort of negative pattern or these negative police interactions between um, or with young black boys um, really has a devastating and cascading effect on public safety, on officer safety, and ultimately, as you talked about right at the, uh, the outset, on the mortality of black boys and um, black men. Um, and so, I guess more specifically, uh, this chapter talks about the three most important environments in which this, low, this legal socialization takes place, the home, the school, and on the street. Um, and, you know, at home, given the long history of negative interactions or, or tension, as, as we, we should call it, um, between police officers and the African American community, it's no surprise to anyone um, on this webinar that um, black families teach their children how to behave with police officers. Um, you know, keep your hands up, don't do anything, uh, uh, don't talk back, avoid any sudden movements, um, you know, don't play, don't be kids. That's ultimately what, what black families have to teach their, their children. Um, and so although these, these uh, messages are designed, of course, to keep their children safe, at the end of the day, we are um, uh, perpetuating and transmitting, understandably, um, the norms, um, the, the tensions from uh, generation to generation uh, between uh, black youth and, and uh, police officers. Um, in the school environment, legal, legal socialization is really intensified for young African-American boys who go to school and um, schools that are heavily 
policed or with a heavy police presence. And all of us know how prevalent metal detectors are, um, school security cameras are, school resor resource officers have grown tremendously. And it's ironic that school resource officers are, are much more common in urban uh, schools with uh, over 1,000 students, um, when the reality is that mass shootings, which is when school resource officers started, but mass shootings were largely in suburban um, uh, middle class um, uh, uh, white schools, but yet we see school resource officers predominantly in these large urban schools with predominantly youth of color. Um, it's also ironic that um, that school that advocates or proponents of school resource officers believe that SROs, I'll call them, um, are, are 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 really important to improve the relationship between um, children and police officers. But the reality is um, police officers are police officers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, they investigate crime, they make arrests, they provide information from the school to probation officers. And so police officers are police officers. And their visual presence at the school, often with guns at their sides, batons at their waist, um, pepper spray um, just only reinforces this traditional notion of, of law enforcement officers in their traditional positions. And so, um, and then on top of that, you've got racial disparities in the school arrest rates. Um, and this is all communicated, it's all evident and apparent to black youth. And again, undermines uh, police legitimacy, undermines notions of police fairness. And then this final third area. Um, uh, of legal socialization occurs out on the streets. Um, we all know um, there's been a handful, let me start with a handful of qualitative studies um, looking at the ways in which, or documenting the ways in which black boys perceive their interactions with the police. Um, and then in and I can speak from my own experience as a um, multi-year public defender with, with, young, uh, with young children. Children grow up watching their friends and their family members accosted for the most minor infractions, tinted windows, music too loud, um, uh, not wearing a seatbelt. Um, uh, you know, black boys complain of being stopped multiple times of a day to be frisked, to be um, asked questions, to be asked where they're going, where they're coming from. They're stopped on the vaguest of descriptions. Um, black boys running, two black males in jeans, one in a gray hoodie, um, black males in athletic gear, black um, a male with a bicycle, um, and black boys are perceived to be out of place. Um, you know, not only when they are in uh, uh, white middle class neighborhoods, but also when they're out in public spaces and sitting on their own front porch. Um, and also, you know, black boys are, um, uh, are constantly complaining about police officers treating them um, disrespectfully. Um, they complain um, about officers who use inflammatory language, including racial slurs, profanity, demeaning language like punk and sissy. Um, and all we have to do is pull up um, numerous videos, um, as you talked about, Angela, um, on the internet. And we can see officers who are being visibly rude and hostile um, with, with, with young black males. And so, um, you know, black boys, you know, they take exception <laughs> to being treated disrespectfully um, and being told to assume the position, to put their hands on the heart, the, 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 the wall, the car, the hoodie. Um, and this is the life of a young black male, and they are socialized to respond in these predominant ways of either avoiding the police altogether or becoming aggressive and hostile. Um, and the reality is neither one of them have worked very well to keep our black boys safe, <laughs> either, neither the aggression nor, nor the flight. Um, we see, you know, not only uh, we see with flight that uh, uh, flight is used against a black male, so the black boy who runs away from the police. Um, police officers use it as an additional grounds for reasonable, articulable suspicion, a, an additional reason to stop that black male. Um, not only that, you know, uh, black boys who are, run, we know that black boys can be shot as they're running away with their backs to them. Um, talking back is just not acceptable um, uh, for black boys, it, you know, it puts them in danger. Um, tremendously. So I'll stop there um, so we can engage in, in, in more fluid conversation. But. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So I think we're prepared now to take questions. Morgan, you're muted now. 
Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, yes, we have a couple questions already in, and I encourage you all to send more questions uh, via the uh, questions panel. Um, the first question um, comes from Tracy. With the advent of what seemingly is the rise of neo-Nazis, white supremacy, alt-right, and the seemingly support that they're giving and get, giving and getting from the current president um, and the Department of Justice, what kind of solutions do you all think will work in helping to eradicate the killing of black men? <coughs> Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Um, I'm, no, go ahead. You can go ahead, Chris. I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, it's hard to say what solutions will be to killing. And I, and I am going to take sort of an incremental approach, starting with this question of, of, of legal socialization and, and changing um, attitudes um, about young black boys um, from childhood up. Um, and I'll say some of the what I, what I think, well, some of what will be the obvious, I think some of it relates to training um, of police officers. I mean, it's so foundational, um, you know, training police officers on adolescent development and trauma de-escalation, so much of the violence, you know, even, you know, the, the interaction with uh, Tamir Rice could have, you know, been avoided by just slowing that situation down um, in, in the moment. Um, and so helping officers understand how to de-escalate um, in a moment, how to take time. Um, uh, I, I think um, another one, and these are just solutions generally and, and don't necessarily go to the question of killing, um, but the, the removal of police officers from the school systems. Um, and that might, you know, mm -hmm. sound extreme. Thank you <laughs> for the nods, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Sound extreme to a, to a lot of folks, but I mean, we, we should go that far. At a bare minimum, though, we should um, reduce the footprint of police officers in schools or recalibrate, recalibrate the authority that police officers have in the school context. Um, you know, police officers as, as um, educators at best um, in, in the school system, having school offense protocols that severely limit uh, what police officers can and should be doing in the school in, in environment, um, mm -hmm. among others. So, so thanks for that, Chris. I, I agree with Chris on all of those points, and I'll just add on a few more things. I mean, it, it, it was such a huge question, and I think it sort of made us all stop because it's such the, the answer, the solutions are complex. There are many, many things that have to be done. So, I mean, we unfortunately have someone in the White House who, you know, stood in front of uh, a group of police officers and encouraged them to engage in illegal police in police brutality which is shocking. We have, you know, an attorney general who's trying to go back to the failed policies of the past, law and order, etc. But what can we do? Um, there are a number of things. So Chris mentioned uh, training. Um, you know, there's a whole chapter in the book about implicit bias and, and how that plays a role in police behavior. There actually is good implicit bias training out here that all police officers, I believe that every police department should have mandatory implicit bias training uh, for all of its police officers. So that training needs to be done. But also, Chris talked about removing police officers who act illegally. Well, it all goes back to democracy, as I say. You know, we have the federal government, uh, but, you know, in criminal justice, like only about 10% of all criminal cases are handled on the federal level. The other 90% are handled on the state and local level. And so there are thousands of state and local police departments out there. And most police chiefs are appointed by mayors. And mayors are elected by us. And I think we have to make our voices known that we want a police chief that is going to uh, really demand more of its police uh, officers than the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, unfortunately, through its case law, permits police officers to use deadly force under a wide range of circumstances, much wider range than you and I could use it if we were threatened, for example. But just because the Supreme Court has said that they are permitted to do that does not mean they have to. So we need to have police chiefs who are training their police officers to de-escalate situations, to not reach for a gun you know, at the first instance, to, to not use violence 
uh, in, in every occasion when it's totally unnecessary. And so that goes, that comes back to us, demanding that of our police chiefs, demanding that our mayors appoint police chiefs who have that more progressive view about police, about policing and are not going to you know, police our community in the way that these police officers have done that has resulted in all of these uh, killings. If I could just say one thing too, um, it seems to me we need a sort of two-tiered strategy. The first are you know, practical responses to violence, whether it's committed by police, whether it's committed by neo-Nazi uh, organizers and the like, and, and Angela and Chris have laid out some very strong and, and uh, on-target practical approaches. And I think the second part of the strategy is that, you know, these uh, actions in society take place within a certain political environment around these issues. And so we all need to speak out in favor of fairness and uh, effectiveness and compassion and make sure that we don't have an environment that in any way, directly or indirectly, encourages violence of this kind. We need people of goodwill across across lines all around the country to be speaking out on this to make that quite clear. Um, another question uh, someone asked, well a couple academics are uh, joining the webinar and ask how you introduce these topics at the university level. So Angela and Kristen, if you'd like to take that. Well, a lot. <laughs> I teach criminal procedure, I teach criminal law, and I discuss these issues in all my classes. I'm teaching criminal procedure this semester. Just last Thursday, uh, we talked about racial profiling, we talked about the the Ferguson consent decree, the Baltimore consent decree, the Floyd case. I mean, I talk about it in class, but in addition to that, um, we deal with these issues outside of class a lot. I mean, I happen to be at American University Washington College of Law where our students are very social justice minded and we have lots of programming around it. We've had our own unfortunate racial incidents on campus. Uh, and so our entire community, um, you know, we talk to our students about these issues. Uh, we're hopefully training lawyers that are going to go out there and, and, and not only uh, work you know, in the criminal justice system, hopefully to be public defenders, prosecutors, and criminal justice policy makers who are promoting a progressive agenda, but, but also just people who are you know, good citizens who understand these issues and are going out talking to people in the community about it and, and trying to affect change. And so we do it in a, in a number of different ways. Um, yeah at American University. So I couldn't agree um, more with what Angela said about this, this idea that we, we do it and we have to do it at the university level. Um, you know, I also teach, I teach a juvenile justice uh, clinic, so I still take my students out into the local courthouse and we represent children who have been arrested and charged. And so we not only talk about it in the seminar component of our, our clinical course, but also trying to litigate actively around racial justice issues in, um, in our cases, raising Fourth Amendment challenges, stop and frisk challenges that literally take on the race question directly and explicitly. Um, but beyond that, I, I really want to push us to, to, to think outside of the traditional courses um, where um, you, you think about race. Obviously, race comes up in the criminal justice context, but it comes up in virtually every context if we are creative enough. Um, to think about how it applies in tax, in property, in contracts, um, and the like. And so I really encourage it there. Actually, um, even in trial skills classes, I was teaching a class on opening statements and realizing how much I uh, was bringing in the question of race into the narrative, right? Um, when you think about how to create a, a narrative around what an, what an opening statement is. So it's everywhere. Um, like Angela, I think beyond that, um, we as professors, as academics, actually have an opportunity to speak out in the community. Um, and so um, at, at Georgetown, our juvenile justice clinic um, has expanded into an initiative, a policy initiative and a training initiative. Um, and we uh, offer 
training literally across the country on implicit racial bias for stakeholders in um, the juvenile justice system and it's been expanding into the criminal and family court system. So I might go out and talk about how um, each individual stakeholder group, probation officers, police officers, judges, um, and the like are impacted by implicit racial bias in their decision making, in their behavior, in their assumptions that they are making. Um, and then finally, I just I wanted to note that also um, it, using our, our our, our, our resources, our Georgetown resources, our university resources, we have started um, this year a, uh, in, in partnership with the Metropolitan Police Department, um, a Police for Tomorrow's fellowship program um, that allows um, newer police officers to, um, uh, uh, to, get, to have monthly dialogue and even more and activities and capstone projects around a range of issues and included within those issues have absolutely been um, innovative policing, implicit racial bias, um, policing and adolescent development, uh, things of that nature. So there's so much opportunity um, uh, and so much of a platform coming out of the university space um, to address some of these issues. Um, another question from Joe, um, in regard to the policing of black boys, um, shouldn't we decriminalize uh, children's behavior? He gives examples of in Finland, the incarceration rate went down uh, significantly and uh, the United States incarcerates children at a much higher rate. Um, so he gave lots of examples of how other countries have decriminalized certain behavior and if we should move um, towards, towards that as a policy change. Absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you write that question for me? Um, so I absolutely have written um, on this very topic, criminalizing normal adolescent behavior and communities of color, right? Because um, yes, writ large across the board, we should be decriminalizing some normal adolescent behavior. But let's be clear, it is decriminalized <laughs> um, for white youth um, already in practice. Um, and by that I mean um, we don't make decisions to arrest kids who are fighting at school in many, uh, you know, upper class private you know, schools that are, um, are predominantly white. We arrest and divert kids, school to prison pipeline um, from urban schools with predominantly African American youth. So, so that decriminalization is happening in practice. Yes, um, uh, um, maybe for a more equitable application that we need it legally as well. So what would those behaviors be? Adolescent aggressive speech, <laughs> talking back <laughs> um, is not a threat, <laughs> right? That is, a, you know, a child talking, um, child talking back, um, school fighting, um, you know, you know, resisting police authority um, is one of the most common we hear across the country. Uh, you know, assault on a police officer is defined in a number of ways. In my local jurisdiction, one of the ways you can be uh, charged, at least, with um, assault on a police officer is by resisting arrest. With children, adolescents are fairness fanatics, right? They resist <laughs> um, when uh, when they think that uh, police officers are, are are intrusive and unfair. So I could go on and on about that, but. Um, you know, I will stop. I agree. You know, let me just uh, chime in a bit. You know, the, the question is talking about how does the U.S. compare with other nations in locking up young people. And as is true for both young people and the adult criminal justice system, uh, you know, our criminal justice penalty system is far, far harsher than it is in comparable nations, uh, judged by a rate of incarceration, the scale of penalties that are handed out and the like. And, uh, there's something fundamentally uh, jarring, I think, when a country as wealthy and with democratic traditions that we have has come this far. And some people will suggest that, well, this is based on higher rates of crime in the U.S. And yes, we do have a higher rate of violent crime, particularly with firearms than other Western nations, but in no way does this explain the bulk of what we do in terms of our punishment orientation. And, uh, so I think we do have much to learn from other nations which have successfully kept their incarcerated populations at much more modest levels and contrary to what some people say, if we had fewer people in prison we'd have more crime, uh, they don't see that kind of crime explosion that some people uh, have predicted would take place. 
Uh, the next question comes from Laura, and she says, I live in an urban area where rising murder and violence is creating a climate where policymakers want to add more police and money for police departments. What are some of the best arguments you see to push back against more investment in police and also ways to reduce policing impacts of black men and youth in a conversation of rising crime? Or quote unquote rising crime, sorry. Mark, you want to take that one? Wait, let me start. Um, Yes, police have to be part of the solution to dealing with crime or rising crime. Uh, some of this gets back to issues we've looked at, you know, how are police being used, what are their relationships to the communities that they're policing. Uh, you know, any police chief will tell you that police can only be as effective as their relationships with the community in terms of getting information about crimes, potential crimes, in terms of getting witnesses to come to court to testify, a whole range of sets like that. So to the extent that police are over-policing in some areas for some types of crimes and the resources could be better dealt with, looking at more serious crimes, that's a really important issue to be looking at right there. Uh, the other part of it is that we need some perspective on how to look at crime rates and for one thing not to take a <clears throat> rise in crime that may only be a blip in a long-term trend but a blip that lasts for a year or two. We don't need to rush into punishment. It's an occasion when we should explore what we know about the underlying factors and also to be looking at other ways to intervene. Uh, <clears throat> some cities have had very good experience with sort of street level youth workers and violence interrupters and basically helping us to get at the source of conflict, trying to intervene with potential conflict before it gets out of hand. Uh, and finally, we need to do something about <clears throat> the easy availability of firearms for people who have no good use for them, and you know how we deal with this as a community, how we deal with it as a public safety issue, uh, those are the ways that we can address these things in a much more constructive way. And if I can just add to that, and everything that Mark said, we, we have to think about how we, as, as citizens or residents of our communities, can make an impact. You know, these policymakers, many of them are elected officials. And we have to speak up and let them know that we don't like the policies that they're implementing, or if they're implementing progressive policies, let them know that we do support them. We have to be vocal. I mean, unfortunately, when it comes to the criminal justice system, many people don't want to talk about it, think about it, or even care about it until they or a member of their family is involved in the system, and only then do they start to pay attention. Um, I think it's important that everyone pay attention to this issue, that everyone be concerned about the fact that we are locking up so many people, that this country is number one in the incarceration rate in Western world. We should all care about that issue. We should all care about the fact that we're locking up so many uh, black boys and men in this country and other people of, uh, of color. And so all of us need to speak up, become active in some way, if it's by writing our state legislator or emailing our mayor or making a phone call or participating in a protest. There's so many ways that we can get involved. And one of the one of the things I strove to do in this book as we pull these essays together is I talk to all the contributing authors about writing their essays in ways that are accessible to everyone, not just lawyers or uh, or academics. Because my hope is that this book is a book that anyone can pick up uh, and we and 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 learn about these issues and learn about how to affect change in the chapters that talk about reform. So I I agree with everything that Mark said, but I encourage people to um, to become active in some way, in whatever way you feel you can be active, to push our policymakers uh, to move away from those policies and to implement more progressive policies in our criminal justice system. So a lot of people have asked about Trump and Sessions. One person has asked specifically, has this book been sent to uh, Trump and Sessions? And right. <laughs> if, he read, if, if he, if I believe, if he read books, if I, if he read books, I would send it to him. But I don't believe that he does read. So I mean, you know, maybe someone can read it to him. But. <laughs> 
that. So people um, have questions about uh, the effect these issues um, have had on Trump and Sessions, the Department of Justice. Another woman asking, uh, saying that she's concerned about the larger criminalization of black people with this new um, black identity extremist um, terrorist group that the FBI, I don't know if this is something you're familiar with. Um, is anyone familiar with this question? I, I, I was going to address the issue about, about Trump and Sessions, about that part of the question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yes, we, we should be very concerned and, and I'm, I'm hoping that the process will move so that they won't be in those positions very much longer because the criminal justice policy mm -hmm. that Sessions is attempting to implement are, are frightening. I mean, basically he's trying to go back to policies that have been proven to be failures that members of both parties have agreed have failed and I'm sure Mark could speak to that more. In fact there was bipartisan support for criminal justice reform um, on the Hill uh, before the 2016 election, uh, which of course are going nowhere now. Uh, so he's trying to undo all of the good work that was done by Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch, the former attorneys general, oh, uh, and implement old policies, and that's unfortunate. But I do want people to focus on the fact that, as I said before, only 10% of all criminal cases are resolved in federal court. The other 90% are on the state and local level, and there are uh, good things happening on the state and local level and more can happen with our involvement. So I don't want people to get discouraged by the fact that they're there and I also will point out that when Sessions tried to undo the consent decrees that were implemented in in Baltimore uh, and, in, and in Ferguson uh, by the prior two attorneys general, he was unsuccessful because those consent decrees were signed uh, the agreements, and for those who don't know what I'm talking about, the, um, the Justice Department went into Ferguson after Michael Brown was killed, and although they weren't able to bring civil rights charges, they did do a thorough investigation of the police department there and, and the Ferguson municipality. And if anyone has not read the reports, the Ferguson report and the Baltimore report, you should read them, the shocking findings that are in those reports. But they, the, those two police departments agreed that they wanted to make changes and there are a whole list of changes and reforms that they each agreed to do. Uh, Sessions tried to undo those and the judges said no. And so the changes are going forward. So you know, yes, it's horrible that they're there, but we can still you know, implement change on the state and local level. Let me just add that um, you know the bipartisan support for reform that we certainly see around the country, but also we've seen in Washington, uh, is still continuing in large part, I think. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Senators Grassley, Durbin, and many others, both sides of the aisle, reintroduced the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act that has had very strong bipartisan support. Yes, there are challenges uh, given the president and the attorney general's position, but the support is still there in many ways for moving forward. Uh, we even read reports of Jared Kushner having several meetings with people on the Hill and others focusing on reforms, what can be done now and all that. We don't know where all that's going to go, but uh, you know, it's also the case that a lot of this has been built up over a number of years and is still very solid. So. Uh, you know, we have to be alert to new policies that may be harmful, but also to keep supporting uh, those reforms that are widely recognized and being very constructive now. Yeah. And then I guess the, the one thing that I'll say, sort of adding to both of those comments, is that this is an opportunity, right? This is a catalyst for change, that there's so much outrage around sort of the current administration, Jeff Sessions, the fear of change policy. Let's pay attention, right? It's, it's an opportunity to pay attention. Um, you know, as Angela said, both at the state and local level, very few people vote in local elections that affect criminal criminal justice. So for example, folks running for local, you know, the state attorney generals or running for local prosecutors, running for whatever, you know, sheriff's um, position. And so I think this is an opportunity for us to pay attention, to get information out, um, to become active legislation and, and stay on top of, you know, as Mark says, the current momentum, um, you know, as well as, you know, being attentive to what, uh, you know, what we're facing in the federal government. 
And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the issue that I talk about the most, and that's prosecutors. And thanks for reminding me of that, Chris. Please pay attention to your district attorney races. Uh, back in 2016, there were a number of progressive district attorneys that were elected who are implementing good progressive change in their jurisdiction, and there will be more challenges in 2018. So please pay attention to district attorney races, and as Chris said, to all of the local, uh, state and local um, races that, that have such an effect on the criminal justice system. Great. Um, so there was just one last question that I got from a couple of different people about having strong citizen review boards and overseeing police uh, policy and misconduct. Do, was there anything that one, anyone wanted to comment about police review boards? We should have them. I mean, I think the problem is in the past that a lot of times they um, and I think, you know, the involvement of a lot of the police departments, they haven't really had a lot of teeth, if you will, in terms of being able to discipline police officers. Police officers have very powerful unions, for example, that protect them. Uh, so, we, of course, we need oversight. Um, and the task, the President Obama's task force on policing for the 21st century um, came back with a lot of recommendations about how police departments um, can be improved. Um, and so hopefully some of those can be implemented, especially since they're on the state and local level. But yes, we should have more oversight, absolutely, of police departments. And then I, I would add also making sure that they're representative of the community. It's just, it's too often, it's sort of the, the educated elite that participate, which is important, but it's also how do we engage the entire community, the community that is most impacted by police officers, um, engaging them as participants, active participants in um, these police review boards. So. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Angela and Kristen and Mark, for your time and for participating. Um, if anyone has any more questions, you can email us at staff at sentencingproject.org, and I can make sure I connect you to uh, Mark, Angela, or Chris. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available online via our YouTube channel, and to learn more about the book, Policing the Black Man, uh, please visit uh, www.policingtheblackman.com to learn more about the book and information on upcoming speaking engagements. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.